Welcome back. This is the sixth installment in the seven-part series, Timeline Earth, A Grand Narrative. Today we're going to be looking at the information age. So let's go ahead and zoom in and get started in the timeline. The first thing we do at this, at this point is look at the diagram and try to understand the relationship between us and the natural world. In this particular situation, we see a very thick and very well-defined boundary between us and the natural world. However, we're starting to see the beginnings of a new view of nature developing in this time period that says nature should be saved. We need to save the planet. Well, of course, we know the planet will always be fine, but yet, do we need to save the planet for ourselves? We're actually seeing the beginnings of the environmental movement. We're also seeing, at this time, the opening up of the ethical core, the finally societies around the world coming to grips with the inequities that have occurred over the last thousands of years. So let's look at the conditions here. We have new energy sources, nuclear energy, which um, many view as a transitional energy source towards renewables for sustainability. And that came out of that horrific event of the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, you know, these always have two sides of a coin. We're looking now at computers and internet as a form of communication, exponentially again, um, exponentially allowing the ability to people to communicate across the planet. And we're more and more seeing the planet warming and the planet changing. We're seeing the evidence now of pollution, of the destructive forces that we've had on the planet. And the planet's getting smaller. There's more and more people and less and less space. So let's go down into our timeline and see what we can discover here. And we start off right away down here with Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. Almost every student who studies environmentalism and studies sustainability will have become familiar with Rachel Carson and her book because she began to unveil the complexities of ecosystems and how the use of our chemicals can actually create imbalances in ecosystems where species are threatened. In this case, it was the use of DDT as a pesticide on crops. And her book, The Silent Spring, was one of the first uh, salvos in really changing the way that humanity would think of itself in relationship to nature. And it was at that same time that James Lovelock proposed the Gaia theory, which was the idea that Earth was its own self-regulating bioorganism. Not necessarily intelligent, but able to change and adapt to its own climate and cult its own, clima own climactic situation. Um, although it wasn't scientifically accepted, it certainly changed the way we thought about the world as not an inanimate object that could be plundered for its resources, but actually as something alive and valuable and important. I mentioned before about the uh, civil rights movement and about the ethical core that would begin to open up. Um, unfortunately here, I took a very negative view of the civil rights movement. I, I really should have more slides here. This was a time in the U.S. and in other countries where students and others um, began to wake up and to begin to address the obvious inequities that existed in different countries. In the U.S., certainly the civil rights movement was um, transformational for this country, and it was the beginning of forming the, the basis of a new, more equitable society. Now, of course, um, things didn't change right away, but, but many sacrificed so that those kind of changes might exist. And many people died. This should say JFK here, RFK, X, and MLK were all executed um, primarily probably for their activities in terms of fighting for equity. And we can look through history and see where people died fighting for the rights of others. Um, so very dark period, but very important period um, in, in the world in terms of eth ethics and the ethical core that we need to connect to. And it's interesting that these two kinds of things are happening simultaneously. The, the the human brain opening up to the possibilities that the environment might need to be protected and at the same time beginning to understand that hmm, we need to do something different in terms of the way we think about and treat other people and so this is really a great awakening for the world and a great rethinking of what the purpose of life would be and those things would play out in the next 10 to 20 years so for example Apollo 8 the astronauts on there took the first picture of the earth from outside. It was the first time we had ever seen the Earth as an object floating in space. And that was transformational in thinking about the Earth as an ecosystem or as a complete entity, as a biological entity. And it wasn't long before the first, first Earth Day was celebrated in 1970 and continues to be celebrated around the world now. It was also a time when scientists and others began to really think about addressing the population explosion, the environmental threats, and the lack of resource, the potential lack of resources in the future. One of the most famous equations is I equals PAT, which was by Paul Ehrlich and others to try to map out and define what the limits were of the human ecology to support 
human growth. And um, they predicted that we would have been dead long ago. So, um, you know, there's changes occur and things happen, um, but it was an important point in, in trying to put numbers onto something that was very troubling. Um, in the early 70s, you see in the U.S., for example, the establishment of the Endangered Species Act. This is really the first example of empathy for species other than humans, the idea that animals have not only a uh, need in our ecosystem to exist, that's important, but also intrinsic value of their own rights. Um, also passing the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and establishing the Environmental Protection Agency. Today we take all of these for granted in this country, but these were really groundbreaking movements towards a more environmentally focused society. It was also at that same time, by the way, that we in the U.S. experienced the OPEC oil embargo, where all of a sudden it was the first time that we began to realize that, wow, the Earth's resources are not infinite and we're not in control of the resources we need to power our economy. It was a very humbling time. And I remember having an even license plate at that time that we could get gas on Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, I think, or Saturdays. And depending on what license plate you have would be the day that you could get actual gas. I mentioned before about how math and science begins to reshape our conceptions of the universe and drive worldview shift. In this case, uh, Mandelbrot, the chaos theory, and fractals are all um, ways of thinking about the planet that's le much less predictable, much more indeterminate, and what we're beginning to realize more and more is, wow, things are really a lot more complex than we really imagined in the time of Newton, and that the world is, is operating at levels that maybe we're not completely aware of, and there's still a lot more to uncover, which is pretty exciting, actually. Um, we continue to see environmentalists from around the world. This is uh, Professor Wangari in um, Africa building one of the first green belts, green belts in the world to prevent desertification. This is one of many examples that we can find throughout history. Um, getting back to going back and forth between the ethical core and civil rights and the environmental rights. Here we see that Harvey Milk, the first openly gay mayor in San Francisco, was assassinated. Uh, thereby continuing the, the uh, pattern of assassination of leaders who are fighting for the rights of others. Um, and in the 80s, we saw a series of disasters. I'm trying to get this in the screen. We've got the Bhopal disaster, we have Chernobyl, and we have the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And all three of these disasters called to question whether the risks of energy and resource extraction were worth the benefits. I still think they are, but I think humanity became more and more connected to the risks involved with getting these large sources of energy and resources. And eventually, at the UN, the Brundtland Commission develops um, the foundation for what we call today sustainability. And the famous um, term or famous definition, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And really what we're going to be covering in week two is the ability of this document to unify the desire for profit, the desire for social equity, and the desire to keep the planet healthy and supportive of our activities. It's really, really at the level of, I don't know, say a declaration of independence for the U.S., this document is really forming the foundation for an entirely new worldview, which we'll be talking about in the next lecture. I show the Montreal Protocol here because this was the uh, governments of the world getting together and banning aerosol cans because we knew that that was putting holes in the ozone. So we do have examples where humanity can join forces across borders to solve climactic and or world, world size problems. I'm just going to skip ahead of here, past some minor events. <laughs> um, so by 1990. Three, we start to see the beginnings of the early green movement. And I say green is different than sustainable, by the way, and we'll be covering that in week three. But here we see, um, for example, the American with Disabilities Act. So here's the ultimate um, expression of empathy for those who don't have the same opportunity for others, the idea that buildings should be accessible to everyone. And that was passed by a Republican president, by the way. So, so the idea of only one party or one political group can do sustainability activities is probably not really true. What 1993 was really the watershed moment in the history of, of the movement towards sustainability, especially in the U.S., we had um, William McDonough delivered his um, Centennial Sermon, which you'll be reading next week as one of your readings, one of the key seminal documents and really the foundation of sustainability. Susan Maxim becomes the first president of the AIA, which 
it was embarrassing in that women had already become senators and congresswomen and mayors all around the country, and yet it took until 1993 for a woman to break the ranks of the AIA. And you'll see over the next period, really, this, this is a time when, when the power structures of organizations will be changing dramatically. The establishment of the Green Building Council, which has been a market transformation for the built environment. The greening of the White House by Clintons, by the Clintons. Um, and by the way, Obama just put solar panels back up on the, on the White House. And one of the really seminal books, which you'll be reading some of next week, is The Ecology of Commerce which actually gets to this idea of unifying the desire for profit with the desire to do good for our fellow man and for the environment, really the basis of sustainability. Minor event here, Nelson Mandela becomes president, I'm joking, um, but, but quite, a, quite a remarkable event on itself. A um, couple more things before we get to the next age. We have the beginning of Google and Wikipedia and other free services, which we'll be talking about in week two, but the idea of of what people pay for and what has value is really shifting greatly now in the last 15 or 20 years. Um, and lastly, it's sort of at the end of this period, the Y2K scare, which is, um, I'm sure you all had water in your basement and food stored for months in case the uh, universe ended. Um, but also, unfortunately, the events of 9-11 um, brought to home just how how insecure or fragile life can really be. and and really did set the tone for, for a decade of insecurity, at least in the U.S. Um, and lastly, looking at the um, rise of Monsanto, of genetic, uh, genetically modified organisms, or in other words, food. We'll be talking about this in week two also. Um, but really, we're going to say uh, this period ended around 2005. And we're going to sign off now, and then we're going to come back at 2005 and wrap up this series. Thank you.